Hi guys, Jacob here. I recently did a Ancestry DNA test and I did it through Living DNA and I thought I'd uh, do a little video together of what I found initially and uh, for those who are interested or interested in doing a test like this through this company or not and also for, especially for family or in a state who might be interested. I chose Living DNA as a company uh, to do the DNA test with because they link your DNA to geographical areas and you can. there's also cool features where you can slide back in time and see where the DNA density um, is most commonly found around different parts of the world. There are three main parts to the test. One is based on your family ancestry, which is autosomal DNA. The other is your mother line ancestry, which is mitochondrial DNA, and that's your mother's mother, 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 all the way back to Africa. And the other one is uh, father line ancestry, which is your Y DNA which is your father's father, 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 all the way back to Africa, and that's those two are based on the, the haplogroups. groups. Okay, so if we look here on to the right, you have the family ancestry bit, which you can explore in full. You have the mother line and the father line haplogroups groups and the subclades here, which you can explore in full, which I'll go through. Go through the family ancestry first um, here. So I'm 98 point seven percent European and one point three percent Asia South and you can click here and it does a cool thing and I get Asian toes. Amazing. Okay so now let's click on the explore and full button under family ancestry. Okay so what comes up is four different sections to this. Uh, the first one's a map that shows the DNA in the different parts of the geographical areas that come up and what makes you I think that's just the breakdown of the DNA um, an explanation next to it, the chart, which is like a pie chart thing, and uh, through history, which just shows, which is cool because it shows the map changing through back through history of your DNA matches to different areas, and it takes you a long way back to like past the Ice Age, I think. Okay, so let's go down and try on the map first. Okay, so here is the family ancestry map. Okay, so what we can do is you can click down into the different sub-regions with these markers here for both Europe and Asia. And you have uh, these three sections. So complete, well, here we have attempted to assign all ancestry, allocating unassigned percentages to regions to which they look most similar. There will be more uncertainty associated with these assignments. Uh, you've got standard, here we highlight the sources of your ancestry which are likely to be present using our best guess of the exact source. Ancestry that cannot be attributed to one of our reference population is shown as being unassigned. And cautious, here we have grouped genetically similar populations together. We are more certain about these assignments of your ancestry breakdown. So yeah, they group the, uh, the populations differently. So let's have a look at the complete first. I'm just gonna click on the plus sign now to take us down a region. Cool. So in the, under the Europe section, we've got Great Britain and Ireland as 81.7%. Got Europe, North and West, which is Scandinavia here. And we've got Pashtun, which is 1.3% over here, which is a surprise. Okay, so with the Great Britain and Ireland, you can drill down into the sub-regions, which we'll do. But first, uh, let's have a look at Pashtun. Because why not? Cool. So I'm pretty sure that's Afghanistan and Pakistan there. Okay, Pashtun, first settled as far back as 50,000 years ago. The rugged mountainous regions of Afghanistan and Pakistan today are inhabited by many different ethnic groups. Of these, few are as widespread as the Pashtun, who form a sizable majority across the south of Afghanistan and a notable minority in central Pakistan. Until recently, anthropologists had to rely on ancient oral traditions and tantalizing archaeological evidence to piece together the ancestry of the many groups in the region. An endeavor that has been revolutionized in recent times with the great advances made in genetic analysis. Genetically similar to neighboring Indian populations to the southeast, the Pashtun homeland lies at a juncture between Central Asian steppes, the Indian subcontinent, and the Iranian plateau. As such, the Pashtun genetic signature contains markers commonly associated with many surrounding peoples. This is not surprising. Afghanistan and Pakistan have seen countless migrations and invasions over the years, and Indian, Persian, Greek, Arab, Central Asian, and Mongol incursions have left varying levels of both cultural and genetic legacies from across Eurasia. 
The Pashtun of Pakistan and Afghanistan today are more closely related to each other than to other ethnic groups in their own countries. I throw back to the often shifting borders that accompanied these historical population movements. Cool. All right. Now let's have a look at Europe, North and West. So 17% Scandinavia, Vikings, badass. The North and West of Europe brings to mind imagery of Viking voyages and wintry landscapes. An array of populations and cultures have lived across these lands since the first inhabitants settled here. Ranging from the semi reindeer hunters of Finland and Russia to the Gallic tribes of the Iron Age of France. Okay, so now I'll click on Great Britain and Ireland. It's 81.7%. So most of Scotland here is uh, coloured green, or we'll link to. All of Ireland and the northern tip of Ireland um, in particular. And also different parts of England. So when we go through back through the uh, timeline, I've noticed that this will get a darker and darker colour at certain periods. Which is interesting because there's, there's a big link between the northern tip of Ireland and uh, the highlands in Scotland. And um, also in these different areas, the Scandinavians and the Vikings through history as well have got a connection here. So let's go down into the next level. So this is the sub-regions of the family ancestry map under complete. And we've got the percentages. So we've got Northwest Scotland at 26%. Got North Yorkshire at 21.3%. Cornwall at 8.2%. Ireland at 5.5%. South Wales border at 5.3%. Cumbria at 2.3%. South Wales 2.2%. Aberdeenshire 2.1%. Northwest Scotland and Northern Ireland. 1.8, North Wales 1.8, South England 1.8, East Anglia 1.5, Northumbria 1.4, and Scandinavia 17%. Okay, so there's this is interesting, Northwest Scotland. There's more of a story here than what I first thought anyway, because there's a big link between the north northern tip of Ireland and Northwest Scotland. So let's click on this. The subregions with the three largest percentages are North West Scotland at 26%, North Yorkshire at 21.3%, and Scandinavia at 17%. Which is interesting because Scandinavia has a strong link to both North Yorkshire and North West Scotland. So North Yorkshire had the capital of York, or city of York still does, and that was also called Jorvik in Norse. And it was invaded by the Vikings over the centuries and it's fought with the old English uh, kingdoms and become a major trading hub around the world, so it was a very nice area. So northwest Scotland was also um, all this area here was invaded by the Scandinavians and it's a very Gaelic area traditionally and they become known as the Norse Gales where they invaded, then they integrated and intermarried, etc. And the northern tip of Ireland, up here, uh, they, I'll go into it a bit more, I've done a little bit of research, but they, uh, also hired mercenaries, Scandinavian mercenaries or Vikings from the Dublin area. So that may explain some of the Scandinavian influence, even though it's a, quite a complex history, just have an initial look at it. So overall, uh, I think there's a lot of Celtic and Gaelic influence there as well. And if I click on North Yorkshire, this part of the map colors, click on Scandinavia, Scandinavia colours, you got Norway, Sweden and Denmark there. And before I read uh, the description for Northwest Scotland, what might be cool is to go over to Through History, which is an interesting feature. So from the world point of view, this goes back in time when we started from the world level, Europe level and Great Britain and Ireland. And I think over time uh, the DNA differentiates. So as you go back in time, it kind of forms together more. And you also you'll see migration routes as well if when I go to the mother line and father line after this. So I just hit start. And also at different points of history, they have a description below, which you can scroll down to, and which gives you a bit of a 
I blur them what's going on at the time. So let's go down to the Europe side. We start, so approximately 500 years ago. You see the darker areas here, this part here, Scandinavia. Germany, France, Spain. Okay, let's pick this up. So I go to Great Britain and Ireland. Starting at 934 years ago, post Norman Britain. So it's interesting how the northern tip of Ireland here is really coloured. So I think this side is an Antrim, that side's Londonderry. Okay, so 13,000 years ago, I could stop saying that, all of our DNA is quite similar way back then. And these are the cows, and you can kind of see some of this in the migration routes between the father and the mother line. Okay, so let's go back to the northwest Scotland uh, region of the map, as it's got the highest percentage. And we'll read the description below, but also um, just an initial bit of research. I've found some uh, interesting points that might help illuminate some things. So Irish and Scottish people share very similar DNA. The obvious, obvious similarities of culture, pale skin, tendency to red hair, have historically been prescribed to the two people sharing a common Celtic ancestry. Actually, in my opinion, it seems much more likely that the similarity results from the movement of people from north of Ireland into Scotland in centuries 400 to 800 AD. At this time, the kingdom of Del Riada, based near Balamone in County eight Antrim extended far into Scotland. The Irish invaders brought Gaelic language and culture, and they also brought their genes. Okay, so I found a map of Del Riada. So you got the northern tip of Ireland here, and the Del Riada, a kingdom there, it's around 500 AD. Okay, I found some other interesting points, um, and just I'm just considering the percentage of Scandinavian there, um, which might help illuminate some things. So since the end of the 8th century, Vikings had the most success in Ireland until the Great Viking Ar Army. By 878, lines began to blur between Norsemen, Irish and Dane. Vikings would fight each other as swords for hire for regional Irish kings, most notably the Oi and Neil clan in Northern Ireland, who recruited the Vikings of Dublin. Late 870s, peace in Ireland between Irish and Vikings as they integrated themselves to a certain extent in the populace and political system until Dublin Vikings in 910 started raiding both sides of the Irish Sea, taking control of York. So that's another interesting point where you've got North Yorkshire here and York. Del Riata, the blur between Viking and Gael, or Gaelic, uh, blurred even more than in Ireland. Uh, before Vikings took it over, Delriada was a powerful kingdom who would attack the Orkney Islands and Northumbria, which I think Northumbria is over this way. Late 8th century, Delriada was one of the first hit by Vikings. Viking Age was hard on the west coast of Scotland um, for the North and Norse Gales, which is all through this area here. By 870s, intermarriage and merging became so common it was nearly impossible to differentiate between differentiate between Norse and Gael, leading to the emergence to a unique Norse Gael culture. Till well into the medieval period, there would be a unique Scandinavian and Gaelic culture in Scottish Isles. And saying that uh, Imar dynasty Dublin in Dublin were descendants of Ivar the Boneless. Interesting. Okay, let's read below what it says for Northwest Scotland DNA area. Northwest Scotland. The genetic signature of the northwest of Scotland is as exciting as its colourful history. 
The signature covers from Argyll to the Highlands and everything in between. This area has been changed throughout history by the years of migrations and kingdoms. It has a reputation for its independent warlike tribes, the Picts. To the Romans, these tribal people were called Painted Ones. Unlike the overall literal portrayal in the film Braveheart, they were probably not covered in blue paint, but were actually heavily tattooed across the face and body. It is thought that the genetic signature today is influenced by the Kingdom of the Picts, the original tattoo artists of Scotland. It's interesting. The signature is influenced by Irish migrations and has Irish roots to this day. In 550 AD, the Kingdom of Dalriada spread from Northern Ireland across the northwest Scotland. It was thought to be more of a cohesive introduction than a full-blown violent invasion. Remarkably, the genetic signature of full northwest Scotland closely matches the boundaries of this kingdom showing the extent of an Irish genetic legacy. The Romans called these people Scotty, which ultimately led to the creation of Scotland's name. The Irish legacy has therefore created the name of Scotland, as well as influencing the Gaelic language and genetic heritage. Scotland is often considered part of the solidified Celtic legacy, sharing genetic signatures and cultures with Wales, Cornwall and Ireland. However, the true genetic history is as a much different story, and an unequivocally more exciting one. Until the end of the last ice age around 12,000 years ago, what we now know as northwestern Scotland showcased a vast and freezing landscape, with snow as far as the eye could see. The post-ice age people most likely came over to Britain via the land bridge from Europe and shed a similar genetic signature to people in Germany, Belgium and France today. The reasons for such migrations intertwine with the changing landscape and migration of animals. As the ice melted, people followed the growing trees, flourish, flourishing forage and herds of prey such as deer. They were true hunter-gatherers and took an opportunity to get their next meal to survive. It is, an apparent, it is apparent that the regions across Britain likely share a very similar early connection, but migrations after the ice age have led to a diverse, diversification of DNA. What did farming techniques bring to northwest Scotland? With new farming technologies came new people, and Scotland was no exception. It has been thought that farming had been introduced separately to England and Scotland, bringing on the new Stone Age. It appears more, most likely that farmers first settled in Scotland from Europe, possibly travelling across the, from Brittany. It is uncertain how much of the, your DNA can be attributed to these early farmers. However, the drastic increase in population density after the introduction of farming may suggest that they settled and intermixed with the residing Scottish population, therefore could contribute to the genetic signature today. The Romans encountered the people of Scotland during their invasions of Britain from 43 AD. They named the population Picts meaning painted ones. The DNA of the Picts was likely made up of the previous migrations to Scotland. The Romans had little influence over the northwest of Scotland, and there is not yet evidence of any genetic legacy from them. The genetic signature that covers what is now known as northwestern Scotland has been significantly impacted by events as late as 550 AD. This is the time of Delriada, a kingdom of Gales that spanned across northern Ireland and western Scotland. The kingdom was of Irish origin, originating in what is now County Antrim in Northern Ireland and migrating into what is now known as Argyll and the surrounding areas in Scotland. The genetic signature is thought to be most condensed within these boundaries of this kingdom, suggesting a significant amount of your DNA could be influenced by this Irish expansion. After all, the Irish and the Scottish borders, borders are only a short boat journey away suggesting the natural movement of people between the two countries also occurred before and after the Kingdom of Del Riata was established. The Irish migrations were known as the Scotty to the Romans and appear to have contributed to a large, significant Irish component in the genetic signature of northwest Scotland. Despite raids and invasions, the Viking invasions across Britain appear to have a little impact in terms of genetics. Uh, the further north you travel, the greater percentage of Scandinavian DNA is found. For example, genetic studies suggest that northerly parts of Scotland, such as Cathness, may have as much as 17.5% Norse DNA. After the vast and deadly glaciers of Scotland began to retreat following the last ice age, people from Europe began to populate Scotland. These people were well aware of the optimal places to find food, 
and they appear to have spent most of their time in coastal regions uh, of western Scotland to fish. The diet would have included an array of seafood, uh, but they would have also ventured across more central lands to pursue larger prey and forage for berries and plant. In a very unglamorous fashion, we get most of our knowledge on these people from middens, prehistoric rubbish dumps. They show us what people ate and what they discarded, such as shells from the seafood they consumed. Uh, there, is not, there is not yet reason to believe that the first people in Scotland had permanent dwellings. Instead, they were nomads traveling the Scottish lands in search for, for the best food uh, they could get their hands on. With the migration of European settlers came uh, the end of the Middle Stone Age. The migration brought not only people, but brand new life-changing techniques for the hunter-gatherers in Scotland farming. This marks the new introduction of the new Stone Age, uh, an era of great uh, change and development. The hunter and gatherers of Scotland lived alongside the new farming settlers, gradually picking up the techniques. This led to more permanent housing and a move away from the being true hunter-gatherers to settled farmers. Instead of living off the natural landscape, people began to manipulate it to their advantage. They cleared forests to grow crops, raised livestock, created their own means of subsistence. The population of northwest Scotland from the Iron Age until 550 AD were known to the Romans as the Picts. They were documented as decorating themselves with paint, however the, this idea may have been taken too literally so it is likely that they were instead heavily tattooed. The Picts had the largest kingdom in Scotland from the Iron Age through to 550 AD. They were relentless in their pursuits against invasions and refused to be conquered by the Romans or Angles. This has assisted them uh, a reputation as being uncivilised, free-spirited tribesmen who would fight both tooth and nail to protect their freedom. But they appear to have had their own organisation and social structure. Yeah, wild things. Okay, so migrations, migration movements. The migration from Ireland leading up to the formation of Del Riata would not have seemed that unusual to the Pictish population in what is now known as Argyll. With the close proximity of the two countries, natural movement between the two was highly likely and a common sight in Scotland. The first Irish migrants uh, argued to have even helped the Picts in their idea, uh, ordeal to hold off the Romans. They were known as to the Romans as Scotty, which would likely be the basis of the name Scotland. The very name of the country has therefore been influenced by the Irish migrations. The language of, the, of Scotland was to be formed and modified by the Irish Kingdom, with the introduction of Gaelic to the previous Celtic language of Scotland. The Scotty and the Picts appear to have cooperated for many centuries, perhaps due to the being united by a common enemy in the beginning, the Romans. They collaborated so well that in the year 844, they joined to become one kingdom and one language and shared cultural customs. The Vikings came to northwest Scotland, not only to pillage and rage, but also to trade and settle. They settled in north in the most northern areas, including Hebrides and Caithness. Their presence in Scotland led to the decline of the Del Riadon kingdom leading to their political identity dwindling before disappearing forever. Okay. Okay, got that. Okay, let's have a look at North Yorkshire. I'll go down and read the description in a second. I've got a couple points here I jotted down. Yorkshire is dominated by the ancestry and that has its roots across the North Sea. Groups we have called Germanic, Teutonic, Saxon, Alpine, Scandinavian, Norse, Viking make up 52% of Yorkshire's Y chromosome, compared to 28% across the whole of the rest of Britain. Geology and politics, politics can supply some of the answers to Yorkshire's unique makeup. For about 4,000 years following the end of the last ice age, migrants could walk across to Britain. Many who carry what are called Germanic, Teutonic, Saxon, Alpine and Scandinavian markers travelled to Yorkshire across a vast low-lying densely wooded landmass before the crust of the earth eventually corrected and Doggerland finally sank beneath the waves uh, around 4000 BC. Later in the 5th century AD, Angles, Saxons, Frisians, Jutes and other Germanic peoples beached their boats on the shores of the decaying Roman province of Britannia and still they came. Between the 9th and 11th centuries, the Kingdom of York became a political centre of the Danelaw, which are the Danish Vikings that uh, conquered a big part of England. The eastern half of England that stretched in a diagonal from London to Chester 
where so many settled that a separate set of laws and customs were installed in place of native English equivalents. And they had other sets of Vikings, I think, earlier that came through York, um, when it was called Jorvik, and it was a yeah, major trading hub and it was fought over for centuries. Okay, so let's see what's uh, below in the description. North Yorkshire, the area of North and East Yorkshire has always been a magnet to settlers, farmers, traders and conquerors since the very beginnings of uh, Britain. As far back as 11,000 years ago, this region was home to the Stone Age community of Starkar, a rare semi-permanent lakeside settlement, many times bigger than those usually uncovered by archaeologists. Bronze Age villages erected standing stones across an ancient ritual landscape, and the later Iron Age inhabitants were a part of the largest tribal confederacy in Britain at the time. Perhaps the defining moment, however, for North and East Yorkshire was when the Romans chose to establish York as an administrative and military hub from which they could govern the North. The occupation of Britain may have lasted for a little under 400 years, but successive Anglo-Saxon, Viking and Norman invaders all imitated their Mediterranean forebearers in centralising their power here. Incredibly, the distinctive genetic signature found in this area is probably due in part to the bound boundaries established by these many European settlers. The ancient tribal and Anglo-Saxon borders still shape the region even today. York itself may no longer be a seat of kings and emperors, but the area surrounding the city has not forgotten the unique legacy that they forged centuries ago. As the last ice age slowly receded from Britain around 12,000 years ago, glacier and tundra were replaced with forest and fen. This warmer, wetter climate encouraged new wildlife such as deer, boar and bears to flourish and following closely behind where Stone Age hunters get Stone Age hunter gatherers. While there is evidence of Britain being occupied before the Ice Age, the freezing temperatures across the island then had rendered it uninhabitable. The genetic signature of these hardy nomads can still be detected in Britain today and it is also found in western Germany, northwestern France and Belgium. Despite repeated waves of immigration, conquest and trade, Britain is still uniquely connected to these first men and women. We know that these people settled in North Yorkshire due to the, an incredibly important archaeological site excavated just south of Scarborough. The Mesolithic Middle, Age, Middle Stone Age site of Starker. Starker Archaeology Project, okay. This site shows that people were occupying the land approximately 11,000 years ago by the shores of a vast lake. And around 6,000 years later, there is evidence suggesting a migration from France. These people may have been the first to introduce farming techniques to Britain, which were readily taken up by the indigenous hunter-gatherer population, changing the face of Britain forever. It was around this time that the Thornborough Henges, the stone hedge of the north, were built, predating the pyramids by over a thousand years. Bronze Age. The Bronze Age... Bronze Age saw another wave of migration from the continent from a group known to, ar to archaeologists as the Beaker people, due to the distinctive pottery. It's thought that they may have come from an area, around an area now known as Switzerland around 4,500 years ago. Like other migrants before and after them, both the people and their ideas were absorbed into the existing island way of life. Further standing stones such as the Devil's Arrows were erected during this time, showing some degree of continuity and with the culture that had existed before. The Iron Age, 800 BC to 50 AD, is also characterised by a movement of people from the continent, probably, probably from France, which most likely introduced the continental language and culture to Britain. So also, um, just to read on there, I think there's also, this is around when um, maybe Julius Caesar was all, they were warring with the Celts and the, the Gallic people in uh, across Europe at the time and the Romans were still coming, about to hit Britain or Britannia. The influences felt for most further south where tribes may well have been ruled by migrants from Europe. Up in the north, however, it is more, most likely that the local tribes simply appropriated parts of this new culture that appealed to them and any migration here is likely to have been local in character. By the time the Romans arrived in 50 AD, Yorkshire was at the heart of the largest tribal confederacy, confederation in Britain the Brigantes. These people were known to be warlike, fighting both among themselves and against Roman invaders. 
The origin, uh, origins of York as one of the great cities of Britain lies in the Roman occupation of the region that followed immediately after the rebellion. They named the city Ibercum, which probably meant place of the boar. And it became one of the main Roma, Romano-British cities of the islands. Emperor's visitors were visited, were crowned and died here in its royal palace. And up to 6,000 legionnaires would have been stationed in the city. You can still see the old Roman walls standing here today. For now, no detectable Roman genetic signature has been found in Britain. Quite possibly this is due to ruling elites not intermarrying with local people. Or perhaps due to so due to many so-called Roman people originating from all across the Europe. So I think they're saying their soldiers were from all different parts of Europe in the Roman army. The Romans left Britain in 410 AD and soon after there, after there was a big wave of migration invasion from Germanic people, now known as the Angles, Saxons and Jutes. Gen genetic signatures are very prevalent even in modern times. An estimate from Leslie et al. Uh, suggests that North Yorkshire is amongst the highest proportion of Anglo-Saxon genetics across the UK. North Yorkshire was originally the heart of the Angle Kingdom, called to the, the Kingdom of Deira, which after much feuding joined with its northern neighbour, the Kingdom of Benicia, to form the Kingdom of Northumbria. The Anglo-Saxons successfully ruled almost the entirety of England between several kingdoms for, about, for around 300 years until Viking raiders from Scandinavia started to pillage and settle along the British shores. After many battles, the Norse conquerors successfully took much of northern England. They made York their capital, although they called it Jorvik, and many place names in Yorkshire even today, today have their roots in Scandinavian words spoken here over a thousand years ago. Despite this, they do not appear to have left a clear genetic football to trace here today. Normans were the last conquerors to reach this area and replaced much of the Anglo-Saxon elite with their own nobles. However, it is thought that these new rulers did not intermarry much with the local populace, as so far we have not been able to, to detect the genetic signatures in the modern region. The genetic boundaries that make up the North Yorkshire area distinct are probably due to the some of the ancient geopolitical boundaries established by the centuries of settlers. The Iron Age Brigantes and the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms of Dera both inhabited the area that roughly matches the DNA signature found within this region. So it is likely that these people helped to make this area both culturally and genetically unique. The 11,000-year-old Starkar in North Yorkshire is one of the most important prehistoric archaeological sites in Europe and offers us a window into the lives of the very earliest settlers of post-Ice Age Britain. Contrary to early belief that these people led a fully nomadic lifestyle, new evidence now suggests that these hunter-gatherers could have lived in more settled communities from they could roam uh, to forage amongst bountiful marshes and forests. Shards of bone excavated from the site have revealed a large range of animals eaten at this time, including deer, elk, and hedgehog. Additionally, it appears as though the settlement's inhabitants would have kept pet dogs. Starcar is over 80 times as large as typical sites of that period. Uh, the leading site links some to suggest that it may have held spiritual significant significance for the people that called this place home. Indeed, this would not all, this would not all be all that surprising from the discovery of many deer skull masks that have been found deliberately crafted here, perhaps for some ritual purpose. Successive waves of migration from Europe brought farming and metal tools to Britain, so that by the time the Romans arrived in Britain, most of the island's inhabitants would have lived in small farmsteads and settled villages as part of the larger tribal areas. In Yorkshire, as well as much of the rest of northern England, the Brigantes tribal confederation held power. Although famed as warriors, the majority of people living here would have been simple farmers living in houses made of wood, mud and thatch. Hill forts like the one, in Stan one at Stanwick would have acted as regional centres at this time where people could come to trade and share news, and were also used defensively in times of war. The Brigantes fought both outside and outsiders and each other. When the Romans came, they were ruled by a queen who allied herself with the invaders. 
perhaps to stop her land from being ravaged, perhaps just for personal gain. Yet many Britons were opposed to this and a bitter feud ensued where the Queen and her ex-husband fought for control over the Brigantes. Her ex-husband eventually won and the Romans had to send a legion to quell the civil unrest that followed. The departure of the Romans did little to diminish the importance of this region which went on to form the heart of the Viking Britain. The city of York may have been the seat of Scandinavian kings, but archaeological evidence suggests that the buildings here would have been Anglo-Saxon in character. Single-storied huts built around over open hearths. Unlike the countryside where most of the people would have been farms, the urban area would have been half a craftsman. If you manage to travel through time travel through time to the ninth century York you would have been able to meet potters, smiths, shoemakers, textile workers, carpenters, and countless other specialists that utilised the raw materials in flowing, flowing in from the surrounding area. Trading ships would have sailed up and down the Ouse, or the Ouse there, uh, connecting the region to the outside world. Excavations have been found silk from China and coins from the Middle East here. In particular, York was very well connected to Dublin another hub of Viking Britain. Although the Vikings were driven out of Yorkshire in 954, their influence on the region lingered long after. York was the second largest city in England after London when the Domesday Book was written in 1086 and remained the de facto administrative and religious centre of Northern England for centuries to come. Cool. Okay, so let's click on Scandinavia. Okay, so this description is pretty short. Uh, the genetic mixture of Scandinavia strongest across Denmark, Norway and Sweden, but also possibly stretches into parts of Germany. The story of this land begins with the retreat of the last ice age around 12,000 years ago. As Scandinavia became more habitable, people began to populate the lands. They migrated into what is now Denmark from Northern Europe in pursuit of migrating reindeer that followed the warmer climate. They would have eaten these reindeer as, as well as uh, plants and marine resources. Scandinavia has an abundance of impressive rock art that dates from this time. Images including reindeer, bears and whales bears, bears, bears and whales were either carved or painted onto the rocks. Later people from Northern Europe moved into Denmark eventually spreading the idea of farming into Norway and Sweden around 6,000 years ago. The northerly location of Scandinavia is likely to have an influence over the genetics found here as it was more difficult to invade and other locations in Europe. For example, the Romans never conquered them despite the, the size of the ever-expanding Roman Empire. When you think of Scandinavian history, the Vikings likely come to mind. These people were believers of gods of thunder and war and used their skills in boat, building and navigation to expand their lands through maritime voyages. Oh, cool. So we'll just quickly show you how it changes with cautious. It's interesting, that one island lights up more here, you had Dane Law here. <clears throat> okay, so you can see our northwest Scotland has gone up to 35.5%. North Yorkshire related ancestry, so it's across here. And I think this and that type of links into the Dane Law is the Danish Vikings as well as all the other invasions from Europe and the local people. That's Cornwall, South there's Ireland and uh, Wales, um, South Wales border related ancestry. We'll look at the family ancestry map on a cautious mode. The cautious section says here we have grouped genetically similar populations together. We are most certain about these assignments of your ancestry breakdown. So I think the difference between this one and the standard and complete is um, standard and complete maybe they've broken the DNA groups up into maybe more groups and this one uh, groups together. I think those groups that are more genetically similar I think. So parts of Ireland here are dark blue, Northern Ireland you got Northwest Scotland here in, in the Highlands up here. You also got, I think that's Cumbria. It's part out here and in here. Well, let's have a look. 
Okay, Great Britain and Ireland, 81.7%. Let's go down again. Okay, so the percentage here has changed based on how they've grouped it. So North West Scotland related ancestry is 35.5. North Yorkshire related ancestry, 22.7. Cornell related, 8.2. South Wales border ancestry, 7.5. And East Angler related ancestry, 1.5. Okay, so let's light these up. It's this one. Cornwall. It's interesting. South Wales border related ancestry. Okay. Now let's have a read down the bottom. Okay, so this isn't as long as the standard section, but let's have a read. Northwest Scotland related ancestry. This is a confidence group for Northwest Scotland ancestry with large spread. It includes Northwest Scotland, Southwest Scotland, Ireland, and Cumbria populations. As it is the largest possible grouping for Northwest Scotland and surrounding ancestry, you, you will likely be assigned this if either your ancestry from this region is both small and uncertain, or your ancestry is large but has multiple distinct sources from the region. So the genetic signature of the northwest of Scotland is as exciting as its colourful history. The signature covers Margol to the highlands and everything in between. The area has been changed. The area has been changed through the out the years by migration and kingdoms, and has a reputation for its independent warlike tribes, the Picts. To the Roman sea struggle, people were called painted ones, unlike the overly literal portrayal from the film Braveheart. They were probably probably not covered in blue paint, but were actually heavily tattooed across the face and body. It is thought that the genetic signature today is influenced by the Kingdom of the Picts, the original tattoo artist of Scotland. The signature is influenced by Irish migrations and has Irish roots to this day. In 550 AD, the Kingdom Del Riada spread from Northern Ireland across into the northwest Scotland. It was thought to be more of a cohesive introduction than a full-blown violent invasion. Remarkably, the genetic signature for Northwest Scotland closely matches the boundaries of this kingdom, showing the extent of an Irish genetic legacy. The Romans called these people Scotty, which ultimately led to the creation of Scotland's name. The Irish legacy has therefore created the name of Scotland, as well as influenced the Gaelic language and genetic heritage. Cumbria is a land where spirituality and industry have intertwined for a millennium. A land between lands for much of its recently recent history. This region has always been culturally distinct from the rest of Britain. The hills in the valley have helped to preserve remnants of the old north for generations, while its extensive coastline has attracted new European settlers and traders. Together, these elements have served to make Cumbria's, Cumbria a melting pot of both culture and genetics. The region may seem to be on the peripheries of England now, but in ancient times this area has been the central has been central to many people. Stone Age farmers set up a thriving axe industry in the Langdale Valley, one of the first true manufacturing hubs. The Romans built their famous Hadrian's Wall across the northern part of this land to set and the very edges of their empire, leading to the surrounding areas becoming a vibrant network of settlements and ports. Perhaps because of this, the powerful indigenous kingdom sprang up in the wake of the Roman departure and a boundary roughly matching the genetic borders of this region today. Centuries of settlements by Angles, Vikings, Normans, Scots and English have contributed to the unique regional and genetic heritage that is still strongly felt even today. A common misconception of Ireland's history is that, the, is that it is based on one solidified Celtic group. We are all connected by genetics, culture and customs. However, when you delve deep into the island's past, the story is much different. It is far more complex and no doubt more interesting. Ireland is genetically unique, having a different genetic signature to Britain despite its close proximity. The most ancient populations of Ireland appear to be very similar to those of Britain, yet future migrations are consider considerably different. Farming populations appear to have migrated into Ireland, most likely from Spain, on a huge scale, intermingling with hunter-gatherers of the, of the country. Although there are many subsequent migrations into Ireland, it is likely that the Spanish farmers are responsible for a significant genetic change to the Irish population. Ireland was unaffected by the Romans and the Anglo-Saxons who invaded and settled neighbouring Britain, but did feel the undesired impact from the Vikings from Scandinavia. 
Ireland has often been seen as having Viking ancestry in the past, but research suggests the genetic impact may be much smaller than substantial cultural influence. Influences that resulted from the settlements and raids from the, uh, of the Vikings from 795 AD. There is a shared, shared genetic signature for the areas known as Northern Ireland and southwest of Scotland, including Dumfries and Galloway. The areas are divided by a watery barrier, and historical migrations across the sea have led to a shared genetic, ge genetic legacy between them. The origins of the first settlers in these two areas highlight the beginning of the shared past. Migrations of people from Europe travelled into Scotland and then into Ireland across the sea. This formed the basis for a connect, connected genetic signature. Both Ireland and Scotland are seen as places of Celtic legend, encompassing a tribal genetic legacy and history. However, there is no evidence for there being one huge tribe and there were connected through that were connected through genetics. Thus, the idea that there was one solidified Celtic group is now considered a myth. The genetic signature has a quality that is unusual in the British Isles. It is likely to be largely influenced by relatively, relatively recent events in the 1600s. This event is known as the Ulster Plantation, which saw thousands of Scottish people being placed into Northern Ireland by King James. Not only did this influence language and religion to this day, but the DNA of the Scottish and the Irish was intermixed. Natural movements of people across the sea is also notable, both before and after the plantation of Ulster. North Yorkshire related ancestry 22.7% on the cautious tab and it covers this area of how they've grouped at this time so it's read down the bottom and this it's not a very long one compared to the standard um, description so what does it say okay North Yorkshire related ancestry this is a confidence group for North Yorkshire ancestry with medium spread it includes North Yorkshire South Yorkshire and Cumbria populations as an intermediate size population grouping, it is likely that your ancestry includes all three populations, or your ancestry from these regions is small, and the exact origin uncertain. The area of North and East Yorkshire has always been a magnet to settlers, farmers, traders, and conquerors since the very beginnings of Britain. As far back as 11,000 years ago, this region was home to the Stone Age community of Starkar, a rare semi-permanent lakeside settlement many times bigger than those usually uncovered by archaeologists. Bronze Age villages erected standing stones across an ancient ritual landscape, and later Iron Age inhabitants were part of the largest tribal confederation, confederacy in Britain at the time. Perhaps the defining moment, however, for North and East Yorkshire was when the Romans chose to establish York as an administration and military hub from which they could govern the North. The occupation of Britain may have lasted for a little under 400 years, like success, successive Anglo-Saxon, Viking and Norman invaders all imitated their Mediterranean forebearers in centralising their power here. Incredibly, the distinctive... Genetic signature found in this area is probably due in part to the boundaries established by these many European settlers. The ancient tribal and Anglo-Saxon borders still shape the region even today. Yorkshire itself may no longer be the seat of kings and emperors, but the areas surrounding the city has not forgotten the unique legacy uh, that they forged centuries ago. Cumbria is a land where spirituality and industry have been intertwined for millennia. A land between lands and much of its recent history, this region has always been culturally distinct from the rest of Britain. Hills and valleys have helped preserve remnants of the Old North for generations, whilst in, whilst extensive coastline has attracted new European settlers and traders. Together, these elements have served to make Cumbria a melting pot of both culture and genetics. The region may seem to be on the peripheries of England now, but in ancient times, this area has been central to many different people. Stone Age farmers set up thriving act industry in the Longdale Valley, one of the first true British manufacturing hubs. The Romans built the famous Hadrian's Wall across the northern part of the, this land set in stone the very edges of their uh, empire, leading to the surrounding areas becoming a vibrant network of settlements and ports. Perhaps because of this, a powerful indigenous kingdom sprang up in the wake of the Roman departure, with a boundary roughly marking, matching the genetic borders of the region today. Centuries of settlement by Angles, Vikings, Normans, Scots and English have contributed to a unique regional and genetic 
heritage that is still strongly felt even today. The formation of South and West Yorkshire as a distinctive genetic and cultural uh, region has its roots in perhaps the most mysterious part of Britain's history. As the Romans withdrew roughly 1500 years ago, the island was undergoing a great cultural and de demographic shift. Waves of migration from the northern Europe saw Angles, Saxons and Jutes setting up vast powerful kingdoms, both displacing and integrating with the indigenous Britons. In certain areas, this transition happened quickly with little evidence of warfare, but some post-Roman rulers resisted. The Kingdom of Elmet held out in England longer than most others, a buffer state in southern Yorkshire surrounded by the expansive Anglian kingdoms. Though eventually it fell, remarkably, sorry, remarkable evidence from, this, from the first fine-scale genetic map of Britain shows that the ancient kingdom's legacy is still felt today as a unique genetic signature that can be found in an area almost perfectly matching its probable geopolitical boundaries. This region is the gateway to the north with numerous settlers and conquerors passing through. Stone Age nomads, Iron Age tribes, Roman legionnaires, Anglo-Saxon kings, Viking raiders and Norman knights have all left their mark here. South and West Yorkshire has therefore always been shaped both by its own steadfast inhabitants and the generations of European visitors that have come to call this place home. Oh, interesting. I also think the Dane law was across this region too, but I may be long, wrong, but I think I'm pretty sure it is um, across this section, but you can look that up. Okay, so we've got Cornwall-related ancestry with 8.2% and South Wales border-related ancestry at 7.5% under the cautious uh, tab. So let's have a look Cornwall-related ancestry. And read down here. Cornwall-related ancestry. This is a confidence group for Cornwall-related ancestry where small spread includes Cornwall and South England populations. As the smallest possible grouping for Cornwall and surrounding ancestry, it's very likely that your true ancestry falls inside one or, or both of these two populations. The South England genetic signature reflects the European heritage of this region. Remarkably, we can still detect the DNA of nomadic Stone Age people that first settled in Britain, the end of the last Ice Age. The same signature that can also be found in Western Germany, Northwestern France and Belgium today. These people arrived tracking the new post-age wildlife and building semi-permanent dwellings near lakes and rivers. Over thousands more, over thousands more years of prehistory, they were joined by further European migrations, who often brought in new technology with them, uh, farming bronze and iron. The Romans left little genetic legacy when compared to the Anglo-Saxons. The genes of this region uh, are possibly 10 to 40% derived from these Germanic invaders who later settled into kingdoms. With much of the south of the country being part of the Kingdom of Wessex, which united England and drove back the Vikings. Subsequent Norman invaders politically transformed the region and the next thousand years have seen England and Great Britain at the heart of the global networks. South England's proximity to both the maritime world and the mainland of Europe has helped maintain these connections that first flourished 12,000 years ago. The genetic signature of Cornwall is remarkable as it is more or less matches the geographical boundary between Cornwall and Devon today across the Tamar River. Cornwall is such a is such a southerly spot in Britain, making it one of the last places to be reached by the Romans and Anglo-Saxons. As a result, Cornwall's genetic legacy and cultural customs have taken a different shape to other regions across Britain. And the ancestry throughout Cornwall's history has explored a vast diversity of people and cultures uncovered. Multiple migrations over many millennia have connected the Cornish people to France, Germany, Belgium, and more. Cornwall was, was once inhabited by a tribal group named by the Romans as Cornovi. They originally introduced metalwork from across Europe and made Cornwall a hub for international trade. With the mining of tin, Cornwall became, began to trade with people as far as the Aegean and Mediterranean, placing this little region on the global map. 
The Cornish people were determined in their attempts to resist invasions, holding off the Romans, Anglo-Saxons and Normans for longer than other regions across Britain. Partly this is because of southerly geographic, uh, geographic placement of Cornwall, but is also a result of the proud and resilient nature of Cornish people. The earliest Cornish language survived for thousands of years and it was still um, in widespread use by the 1700s. Okay. Cool photos. Oh, let's go to South Wales border ancestry. South Wales border related ancestry, 7.5%. So this is interesting because the DNA map covers this part of England and I think Wales and Ireland as well. So let's see what it says. South Wales border related ancestry. This is a confidence group for South Wales border ancestry with large spread. It includes South Wales border, Devon, Ireland, and South Central England uh, populations. As it is the largest possible grouping for South Wales border and surrounding ancestry, you'll likely be assigned this is if either your ancestry from this region is both small and uncertain, or your ancestry is large and has multiple distinct sources from this region. The areas known to us today as Gloucestershire, Oxfordshire, and Somerset, South Central England, show genetic signature and archaeological history. The earliest settlers in this area moved across Europe, and after the freezing of vast ice sheets of Britain began to give way to warmer climate, climate the first insight into human life here dates back 14,700 years. There is evidence that these people had cannibalistic tendencies, which may have been ritualistic or may simply have been a way to cope and survive the relentless environment and changing climate. A second migration to Britain brought farming into action and completely changed the inhabitants' way of life. Migrations may have occurred from Normandy and the Channel Islands into the southwest with farming technologies migrating up to south central England. This area is invaded by the Romans, Anglo Saxons, and of the Normans. Currently, there is no indication that the Norman and Roman invasions had any detectable genetic impact on the people of Britain. The Anglo Saxon invasions were, have probably contributed between 10 and 40% of your DNA and, and were even responsible for great changes to the language. Old English. Modern migrations from Europe include having, including having have created a rich and diverse genetic and archaeological history in South Central England. The areas of Shropshire, Herefordshire, Mon Monmouthshire, Worcestershire, uh, Powells and Gwent are collectively called South Wales border. DNA here shows similar genetics with Germany, France and Belgium, which may be legacy to some of the first settlers in Britain after the last Ice Age. These connections first appear with the most ancient settlers of the Welsh border and may still make up a sizable amount of your DNA today. The Celtic tribe Silures occupied much of this area and were famous in passion against the Roman invasions. The South Wales border is a place full of imagination and mythical legend. King Arthur and his knights of the Round Table were thought to have originated in Carleon, being part of the British defence against the Anglo-Saxons. Such myths are based uh, around some of the truth and some truth from historical events across the borders. Wales was part of the British defence against Anglo-Saxon invasions. The genetic signature of the Welsh borders may differentiate from both England and the rest of Wales due to this invasion. It experienced less genetic impact from the Anglo-Saxons than the English, but saw more of an impact from the south and north regions of Wales. Over many a millennia, people that have moved in and out of Devon from the earliest known humans in northwest Europe, residing in Kent's cabin in Torquay, to the Norman invaders of 1066. This has resulted in Devon representing a distinct genetic signature within the British Isles. With vast ancestry from both Cornwall to the west and the rest of Eng England and to the east. Devon's position to, on the border between Celtic and Germ Germanic populations has influenced the genetics of the Div Devonians. Its geographic location enabled its people to resist against invaders for longer than most, leading to a stronger connection to Britain's ancient past. In prehistory, the precise opposite was true. There is evidence that De Devon was amongst the first places to be settled by the Ice Age 
uh, after the Ice Age by European hunter-gatherers, originally made Britain their home. These people were joined by successive waves of new Stone Age migrants from the mainland who introduced new technologies and new ways of thinking. Hunter-gatherers became fathers, uh, fathers, no, farmers and villages became towns. The Romans had only a small presence in the region, establishing Exeter and building roads and villas before leaving again. A new Celtic kingdom was founded and stood to resist the Anglo-Saxon invasion before finally being defeated. This pattern repeated itself when William the Conqueror invaded before Devon finally became a true part of England. A common misconception of Ireland's history is that it is based on one solidified Celtic group, all connected by genetics, culture and customs. However, when you delve deep into Ireland's past, the story is much different. It's far more complex and no doubt more interesting. Ireland is genetically unique, having a different genetic signature to Britain despite its close proximity. The most ancient populations of Ireland appear to be very similar to those of Britain, yet future migrations are considerably different. Farming populations appear to have migrated into Ireland, most likely from Spain, on a huge scale. Intermingling with the hunter-gatherers of the country, uh, yeah, okay. uh, although there are many subsequent migrations into Ireland, it is likely that the Spanish farmers are responsible for a significant genetic change to the Irish population. Ireland was unaffected by the Romans and the Anglo-Saxons, invaded and settled neighbouring Britain, but did feel the undesired impact of the Vikings from the Scandinavia. Ireland has often been seen as having Viking ancestry in the past, but research suggests that the genetic impact may be uh, much smaller than substantial cultural influences that resulted from settlements and raids of the Vikings from 795 AD. Okay, I'll click on East Anglia related ancestry at 1.5%, but I'll just skim through the description. Okay, so that's those areas. Okay, so this is a confidence group for East Anglia ancestry with medium spread. It includes East Anglia, Northwest England, and South Central England populations as an intermediate sized population grouping. It's likely that the ancestry includes all three populations. All your ancestry from these regions is small and the exact origin uncertain. Okay, so it's just saying there how they've come across. This area was invaded by the Romans, Anglo-Saxons and the Normans. Currently there is no indication that the Norman and Roman invasions had any detectable impact on the people of Britain. The Anglo-Saxon invasions have probably contributed between 10 and 40% of your DNA. We'll talk discuss that before. Okay. Forged by flood, the coastal regions of East Anglia was created approximately 8,000 years ago when uh, Britain first became an island. Since this time, a multitude of migrants have sailed across from Europe and settled on their shores, mixing with the older cultures and kingdoms to create a dynamic regional heritage infused with ideas, practices, and the people and people from the continent. Equally as important as the sea, the fens, and the rich farmland found here have convinced ge generations of these wanderers to stay, leading to a gen genetic signature unique to the area. Hunter-gatherers cross in, hunter-gatherers crossed into Britain here at the end of the last ice age, and further migration in the millennia that followed brought revolutions in agriculture and metalwork. This is also the region of Boudicca, the Iceni queen who led the revolt against the Romans. She was ultimately unsuccessful, yet the Romans eventually withdrew from Britain due to instability within the empire, leaving East Anglia for the Anglo Angles and Saxons who sailed across from modern-day Germany and Denmark. Their most famous treasures, the Sutton Hoo burial goods, are found here, showing off the wealth of the, and European connections of these ancient kings. Quickly integrated into Norman England following Wing's conquest of 1066, the past thousand years have seen East Anglia maintain these ancient European connections as an integral part of both England and Britain. At first glance, a genetic signature unique to Northwest England, region comprised of Cheshire, Merseyside, Lancashire, and Greater Manchester does not appear to correspond to any well-known historical boundaries. In fact, the region has often been divided at various points between rival Iron Age tribal confederations, distinct Roman administration districts, and warring Anglo-Saxon kings. To make sense of this region, we must delve deeply into one of the most mysterious eras of Britain's past. 
In the aftermath of Roman departure from the island, long forgotten native kingdoms rose and fell, leaving scant written and archaeological evidence of their existence. These through clues found in ancient Welsh poultry and wind swept hill forts. We know of a kingdom named Rigged, okay, present on Britain's northwest coast around the time up when the Anglo Saxons were, were arriving on the eastern shores. Split by via inheritance, the southern portion of the kingdom appears to match the genetic boundaries found in the northwest England region today. It therefore appears that this area's distinct DNA signature originates from this time, and it's probably rooted in the stubborn resistant of, resistance offered by the people of the north against the invading Anglian kingdoms. South Rigged was eventually conquered and has since seen Anglo-Saxon, Viking and Norman settlers contributing to a vibrant British and European heritage. Let's look at the through history map. So I went through this before. If you hit start, the description down here, type of changes as you go back through history. So I'll send, I'll send the link. I'll share the link of um, uh, of this so you can have a look for yourself. So if you play, see so it all kind of expands back through time. And down here, that description changes. You can have a look at that. It's gone all the way back until I think we all have the same DNA. Yeah, cool. So, get the year, get the same. So, 500 years ago. I'll just have a quick scan here so there's something interesting. Hey, Danny, migrations at this time were not just driven by the desire to explore new lands, but also by religion and conflict. Internally within Europe, many movements of people occurred between the 14th and 16th centuries as a result of religious strife. Many of the migrations were forced, such as the ostracism of Jews from Spain in the late 1400s. This era also saw a significant movement of Protestants from the Spanish Netherlands into the Dutch Republic. By the 1600s, religion motivated by the Spanish to expel the Moroscos, Moroscos, yeah, okay, and the French to expel the Huguenots. Uh, the movement of people as a result of the Ulster plantations was intertwined with religion and politics. So that relates to Northern Ireland, and uh, political politically by placing Scottish populations into Northern Ireland, King James hoped to create a wider spread spread sense of loyalty to the crown. Religiously, the Scottish people brought protest. Protestantism, Protestantism <laughs> into the larger Catholic region of Northern Ireland. Language, religion, and genetics were changed as a result of this population movement. Okay. And both sides of my family are originally Catholic. But so, interesting if that's impacted it. Okay, so if we go up to Great Britain and Ireland, let's see what it says here. Okay, 934 years ago it starts at, so 1066 may just be the most famous date in British history, but from a geneticist's point of view, it's not all that interesting. There seems to be little to no genetic trace left by the Norman state, perhaps because of they came across the channel in rel relatively small numbers. Whilst there was certainly devastation to the local populations following failed rebellions in the north, life of the surviving peasantry would ha not have been all that different following the Battle of Hastings. It has been almost a thousand years since this war for the English throne, and in that time, the boundaries within England itself has changed remarkably, remarkably little in places. As such, we see little in the way of genetic splits between different populations after 1066. As the political power of the Normans and their progeny largely held the country intact. The same cannot be said, however, for the border regions of Wales, Scotland, and Ireland in the centuries following William the Conqueror's invasion. Well into the 20th century wars and insurgencies have been fought over the rights to rule these territories. And so it is no surprise that we see genetic divergences occurring in these places. Cumbria and Northumberland formed distinct clusters from one another during this period, whilst Northern Ireland and Southwest Scotland area see a huge demographic shift due to the Ulster plantations set up during the reign of King James I. 
South Wales also split into eastern and western clusters at this time due to the great influx of English settlers into South East Wales during the numerous wars fought for control here. As a result, many of the people from this part of Britain today have a unique mix of ancestry with a strong Welsh component also intermingled with Anglo-Saxon signatures. Okay, so let's let it play through. Let's start. Cool. So what I might do is I'll just hit restart on that. And I'll just go down here so if something pops up, that's cool. As I said, I'll send the link, so if you want to check this out. So what's cool about the timeline is that you can go back through history, see what was going on at that time, and then look where your DNA groupings were most dense, um, and also what your DNA splits were, and you can kind of piece together a bit of a story of what may have been going on at the time, and it's you know fun and interesting. Okay, so let's go and check out the mother line and the father line, uh, the haplogroups. groups. Start with the father line. Your father line ancestry. Overview. Your father line is your direct paternal heritage, passed down from a father to their sons through the Y chromosome, Y DNA. Through Y DNA, you're able to trace back up your direct paternal line until the point around 180,000 years ago when there appears to be a common Y chromosome. As our ancestors changed how they were living from generations to generations, created changes in the Y DNA which is shown as branches of the Y DNA tree. Today you can explore your father line, finding out which branch of your Y DNA you are, uh, you are on and where it is most frequently found today. You're also able to discover the possible migration routes of uh, your ancient ancestors, your ancient ancestors could have taken. Cool. So it says here, my Y DNA, your haplogroup is RP312. My subclade is RZ278. So, you know, this goes beyond surnames, but, you know, this is probably what the Barlings are interested in. Um, and we'll kind of link up the Barlings of Life Day through uh, Pop Barling, Jimmy Barling. And uh, I read somewhere that Barling, uh, Ling means son of, and Bar means bear. And bear was, I think, Thor, or maybe Odin. I think it was Thor's animal like, in that religion way back in the day. And it could be, uh, yeah, son of boar. And they, it was common to pick an animal that was um, aligned to one of the, the gods in those uh, old religions. So I'm not sure if that's true or not, but I read it in an old uh, surname's book, I think, on the internet when I was type of looking up stuff. Okay, cool. So let's check this out. So coverage map. So haplogroup. So it's, this is interesting. So Spain is 35%. Where it's found, you know, France at 32%, Norway at 10%, Scotland at 10%, Netherlands at 7 Germany 7 England 7 Ireland 6 Italy 5 and then your Poland, Russia, and Balkans at 1%. Okay, so, I just want to explore in full. Okay, it's the same thing. So I found something interesting. So we'll go before I do that. We'll go to the migration map. The migration map shows the journey that your an ancient ancestors could have taken as they spread out, and moved across the globe, allows you to see how you fit into the human family tree. The start of the journey is taken from a point in time when, as heroes, we all shared the same Y DNA, 
and each colour change in the lines represent a change in that Y DNA, giving rise to a new paternal haplogroup or branch of the human family tree. You will share an ancient tens of thousands of years ago ancestor with everyone who shares your haplogroup. As our understanding develops, the exact routes taken may change and stop the stopping point may or may not reach your present location. I offer a great indication of your ancestry but should be also be understood with this limitation. Cool. Right, watch this. Oh, interesting. I found this as well, and it said Spain was 35%. I think this is one of the haplogroups and one of the, the routes that went through the Basque area, through here. It actually had parts of Cornwall on my um, uh, DNA map. It goes to Ireland, Scotland. That's, I thought that was interesting. History. Let's read that. Genetic story of your father line. Analysis uh, gives your haplogroup RP312, your earliest ancestors reached Britain and Ireland around 2500 BC. Geneticists can tell that there was very rapid expansion of population because P312 immediately divides into many subgroups, a sign that many sons of each man were living, as were the grandsons of these men. Lineages were multiplying as people multiplied and spread. The rate of fertility was exponential, and your P312 markers expanded in every direction. Along with skills, skills making particularly fine style of decorated pottery, they were also skilled goldsmiths. It appears that they could extract copper from ore and work it. This was probably seen as a magical process, the use of fire to change dull ore into bright and shiny objects such as jewellery and weaponry. Who were the people who carried your signature? Uh, farming was already important, but your ancestors probably derived their tremendous prestige and power from their other skills. The decorated beakers have occasionally been found to contain the residue of beer and there is some evidence that the cultivation of barley increased after 2500 BC. However, it was more likely that their abilities as metal workers powered their expansion. Copper is a comparatively soft metal but it could, have, could still be fashioned into fearsome weaponry. Acts like halberds have been found. It may well be that the dominance of R1B lineages in general and RP312 in particular came about because of an aggressive takeover of land. Your P312 marker continued across the North Sea. With early medieval invaders such as Jutes, Angles, Frisians, Saxons and North Vikings as well as German auxiliaries that came with the Roman legions. Now the science. Your Y chromosome Y DNA is passed down from father to son, which we refer to as your father line. The Y chromosome is the sex chromosome that determines you are male. And so only sons inherit the Y chromosome from their father, who inherited from the, his father, and so on. It is a direct male line you can trace back along your entire history. Your have a group is a collection of related family lines you are connected to through your Y chromosome Y DNA. You share a common ancient ancestor with all the people who share your haplogroup. Haplogroups can, asso can be associated with geographic regions and are also used to trace the ancient migrations of human early humans. The details and history of your haplogroup are, and you can view, on a, view a map of your haplogroup's distribution today, your haplogroup's speculated migration route over thousands, hundreds of thousands of years and where on the white DNA tree you fit. The maps used are what we know today to be the borders of each country. However, these have just been created for political reasons. This means that although you may have been, may, you may be show, shown your ancestors comes from certain countries. This would have looked uh, very different 100 years ago. Cool. Okay, let's see what the phylo, phylogenic tree is. Cool. So this is how they find all the DNA um, thing. splits and variances. So wind this up. All back to Adam and Eve up here. We started with a root. Just down here.
don't have a mouse for a second. Oh, this is easy. This is me here. And the human family tree. So this is the uh, paternal one. So father's father, 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 and so on. Okay, so this section, your mother line ancestry, overview. Your mother line is your direct maternal heritage, passed down from a mother to their child through the mitochondrial DNA, MT DNA. Males receive MT DNA, but do not pass it on. Mitochondrial DNA allows you to trace back up your direct maternal line until the point around 200,000 years ago when there appears to be a common uh, mitochondrial DNA signature. As our ancestors changed how they were living from generations to generations, it created changes to, in the mitochondrial DNA, which is shown as branches of the mitochondrial DNA tree. Today you can explore your mother line, finding out your, which branch of the mitochondrial tree you are on and where it is most frequently found today. You are also able to discover the possible migration routes your ancient ancestors could have taken. So the mitochondrial DNA is Haplogroup, haplogroup is H and subclade declared is H6A1A. Cool. Let's have a look at the coverage map. That's interesting. So it's most commonly found in the Turig, of course, which is there. I think that's, uh, it might be Algeria there. Is that Algeria? But that's interesting. I've actually um, spent time with some Turig in the Sahara Desert when I was in Morocco. Once, which was cool. So it's also found in Wales, 60%, Galicia, Spain, Hungary, Romania. Oh, it's pretty high percentages in all these countries here. Right across Europe, and even into the Middle East. Yeah, a strong Middle Eastern type of um, percentage there too. Let's look at the history. Okay, haplogroup H is one of the most common groups in Europe. It is found in most European countries. Your mother line signature belongs to the H group. This group is thought to have originated between 25,000 and 30,000 years before the present. Its exact place of origin is unclear, but it's most likely arose in or around the northeastern regions of the Mediterranean. However, it has also been argued to have risen in Southeast Asia or the Middle East. This group is one of the most common across Europe, but is also found in lower frequencies in parts of the Middle East. There are also many subclades to this group, and at this point in time, 90 have been verified. Although not confirmed for certain, it has been suggested that the carriers of the haplogroup H were involved in the recolonization of Europe from the Ice Age ref refu refugium locations. Populations potentially carrying haplogroup H1 and H3 could have been involved in the recolonization of the western and central regions of Europe at the end of the Ice Age. They likely migrated from a refugium between northern Spain and southern France. It is this recolonization that is thought to be responsible for the high frequency of the haplogroup H in North Africa. Gibraltar likely acted as the midway point between these two continents. Okay. Okay, so who were the people who carried your genetic signature? Your mother line, your mother line originated during the height of the Ice Age. Up to 35,000 years ago, conditions would have been extreme and competition for resources was fierce. Carriers of your mother line may have been at the heart of the recolonization of Europe. At this time, people uh, would have been very hardy nomads, traveling with the melting ice caps and migrating animals. They would have moved as when the harsh climatic conditions allowed them and would have relied heavily on the foraging plants, hunting land animals and occasionally fishing for seafood such as mussels. The climate had a snowball effect, first changing the environment which in turn changed where people lived and what they ate and how they hunted. The climate change caused the ice to melt rapidly and as a result the sea levels rose by 52 feet across a 500 year time span. Subclades of your mother line are found in very high frequencies in North Africa, particularly amongst the Tuareg. The northern populations mostly inhabit, inhabit the desert. Comparatively, the southern Tuareg mainly inhabit the steep. The traditional skin tent homes are largely being phased out, replaced by an ever-growing urban lifestyle. Okay. 
so the sides. Within each of your cells, you have thousands of mitochondria, struct mitochondria uh, structures with which supply energy to the cell. Your mitochondria have uh, their own DNA, which makes it possible to trace the mother lines of the individuals across the world and see how they connect. As our ancestors changed how they were living from generations to generations, it created changes to the mitochondrial DNA, which is shown as branches of the mitochondrial DNA tree. Each person on this planet receives their mitochondrial DNA from their mother, who received it from her mother, who in turn received it from her mother. Males also re receive their mitochondrial DNA from their mothers, but do not pass it on to their children. Uh, as the few mitochondrial Mitochondria that power the sperm before it fertilizes the egg are dwarfed by the thousands of mitochondria in the egg. Your haplogroup is a collection of family lines uh, you are connected to within the mitochondrial DNA. You share a common ancient ancestor with all the people who share your haplogroup. Haplogroups can be associated with geographic regions and are um, also used to trace the ancient migrations of early humans. The details and history of your haplogroup are, and you can view a map of the haplogroup distribution, your haplogroup's speculated migration route over th hundreds of thousands of years and where on the mitochondrial DNA tree you fit. The map used, to, used uh, what we know today to be the borders of each country. However, these have just been created for political reasons. This means that although you may have been sh uh, may be shown your ancestry comes from certain countries, this would have looked very different 100 years ago. Okay, so let's have a look at the migration map. There's a route. Cool. It's interesting. And go to the phylogenetic tree. Let's see if we can zoom out without a mouse. Okay, so this is I think this is every time the DNA splits or mutates. Um, this is when we're all the same, the root, like Adam and Eve type of times, or whatever it was. Then it splits down through here to the different groups. The R's, HV, then the crews over here. And then get to uh, mum's H6A1A, which is me. Cool. Okay, so I'll send the link around and people can have an explore, explore by themselves. And uh, yeah, found it interesting. So I've done a little bit of research, but I need to really look more and um, find out more about this. Uh, some of the clues that are found here. And um, yeah, cheers for checking it out and throwing me questions or any information that might help enlighten me. Um, send them through to me and I'll get in touch, especially family members and uh, friends. Okay, peace out. Hope you're all well.